Good morning, guys. How are we this morning? Good? 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 <laughs> well, I just want to say thank you. I'm so honored uh, to be up here speaking to you today. It truly is a, a blessing. I would like to play a game with you guys today, a little game that I like to call What Went Wrong. There's going to be pictures of some cookies up on the screen, and in each cookie, a key ingredient of the recipe was left out, causing the recipe to be a fail. Now, I want you guys to guess what that missing ingredient might be. Let's see the first one. What do we think? Who thinks eggs? Raise your hand if you think eggs. Okay. Raise your hand if you think sugar. Raise your hand if you think flour. Okay. Raise your hand if you think butter. Okay, it's eggs. This cookie has no eggs. All right, next one. All right, what do we think? Sugar? Flour? Butter? It's sugar. There is no sugar in this cookie. I guarantee you that cookie tastes absolutely awful if there's no sugar in it. Next one. All right. Now this one. Does not look appetizing. Nice and crispy. All right. What do we think? No flour? No flour? No butter? It is no flour. And lastly, come on. This one is easy, you guys. What do we think? Yes. Four times the charm. It is no butter. Now, I don't know if you guys know this, but I'm a bit of a baker myself. I love to bake. Right, Mom? Yes. Yes. And as you can imagine, I have done something like this myself before because not every time we bake is it perfect. It was a holiday like Fourth of July or something, and I wanted to make a Marionberry cobbler with a little like Dutch apple pie type of topping, you know, the brown sugar crumbles. Mm -hmm. So tasty. And I mixed everything up. I put it in the pan. It looked absolutely divine. I was so excited to eat it. I put it in the oven. I let it bake. And it was ready. I took it out. And oof. <laughs> it was not a pretty sight. Let me tell you what. The topping had melted completely and caramelized. It was just, it, it was, I was very disappointed. It was not good. Don't get me wrong. It was edible. It tasted fine, but it was not as good as it could have been had I gotten the recipe right. And I think that a similar thing happens when we leave the Holy Spirit out of our life and our ministry. And that's what today's passage is on. It's on being spirit-centered. And our passage comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Now, I wanted to read from the Hawaiian Pigeon Bible today, but <laughs> Dr. Williams advised against it, so, alas, good old ESV. Our passage says, And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not implausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Yet among the mature we do impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory, None of the rulers of this age understood this. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the Spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, 
that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. And he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Now to break this down for you. This is a continuation of chapter 1. And if you remember on Tuesday... Ben Bishop talked about chapter 1, which is all about the wisdom of God, and specifically perspective. Chapter 2 is a continuation of this theme of wisdom. In the first few verses, Paul is talking to the Corinthians, and he's saying, when I came to you, I didn't have wisdom. I didn't have eloquent speech. I was afraid. I was so afraid that I was trembling. And he follows this in verses 4 and 5 with a key point. He says that, he didn't come with all this wisdom or eloquent speech, but he was able to preach to them and do what he did in Corinthians because of the power of the Spirit. And he did this so that the Corinthians' faith would not be on Paul, but on God and the power of the Spirit. And in verses 6 through 10, Paul comes back to this theme of wisdom, explaining what the, what the wisdom of God looks like and how we receive that. And he says that the wisdom of God, it's hidden, it's secret, and it's reserved only for those who love God. And the only way, he says, in which we can receive such wisdom is through the Holy Spirit. In the last few verses, 10 through 16, Paul continues on the topic of the Spirit, going back and forth with what it looks like for those who have the Holy Spirit, who have the power of the Holy Spirit, what it looks like for those who do not have the power of the Holy Spirit. Those who don't are foolish, and those who do are wise. Now, throughout this passage, Paul references the Holy Spirit again and again and again. And if you guys learn anything from biblical interpretation, which I trust that you did because you were all very studious students, you learned that when something is repeated in Scripture, it's important. So if Paul continues to bring up the Holy Spirit... Obviously, he thinks it's important. But why? I think that Paul is trying to tell us that the Spirit is the key to everything. The Spirit is the key to everything. To recognize the importance of the Holy Spirit in our lives, we have to recognize what it's like in our lives when we don't have him. We have to recognize the results of leaving him out of our life and our ministry. The first result of leaving out the Holy Spirit is self-doubt, something that I think we're all a little bit familiar with. When we self-doubt, it can be a major hindrance on us fulfilling our calling because when we have self-doubt, we say things like, I'm not good enough, I'm not smart enough, I'm too young, I'm too inexperienced. We say these things and believe these things over and over again until it becomes all-consuming and it causes us to miss out on our calling completely because we're afraid. For example, a lot of you take tests around here, right? As a student, if you were to leave the Holy Spirit out and listen to self-doubt, you would go into your test saying, I'm so stupid, I'm not smart enough, I'm going to fail this test, I don't know anything. And guess what? You will if that's how you go into it. The second result of leaving out the Holy Spirit is self-reliance. I think self-reliance is a little bit more dangerous, a little bit more sneaky of a hindrance to our calling because it disguises itself as good. We live in a world that is individualistic, that preaches, you do you, boo, you know, do it yourself, Speak your truth. So when we become self-reliant, at first, we might think that it's good because we think, I'm in control. I got this. Things are going to go my way. Things are going to be great because I got this. But after a while, 
the more we become self-reliant and start to take things on because we think we can do it ourselves, the more we fail at everything. We get burnt out, overwhelmed, exhausted. We start dropping things left and right, leading us to be unfulfilling in our calling. For example, if you went on the opposite end of that test thinking, I got this. I know my stuff. I don't need to study. I was in class. I paid attention. You go into that test with all that confidence. You take it. You finish it. You get your grade back. And you failed. And you're like, well, I guess I didn't have that. I guess I should have studied. Whether you're self-doubtful or self-reliant, the only true way that we can overcome these is when we fully embrace and trust in the power of the Holy Spirit to work in our lives. Because when we do, it's the Holy Spirit who gives us the ability to do what it is that we are meant to do. He gives us the ability to do what it is that we are meant to do. Whether that be, you know, you're reading scripture and, and you understand it, it connects with you, it resonates with you. It's the Holy Spirit who revealed that wisdom of the word of God to you. Whether you're praying to God with moanings and groanings, God, please, I need help. Hear me. It's the Holy Spirit who translates your prayers and communicates those to God, who communicates the desires of your heart to God, and who communicates what God says back. If you have a spiritual gift, and you're like, I know what my spiritual gift is, and you love to use that to serve others, guess what? It's the Holy Spirit who gave that to you. Without him, you wouldn't have it. When we include the Holy Spirit in our missions and in our life, great things can happen, great works happen in our lives. If you want an example of the Holy Spirit working in someone's life, look at the author of this passage himself, Paul. In the beginning of this passage, as I mentioned earlier, Paul mentions to the Corinthians, he's like, I wasn't smart, I wasn't a good speaker, I didn't have anything. But I had wisdom when I spoke to you because of the Holy Spirit. Paul could have, in the beginning of this passage, he could have been like, hey, it's me, Paul, you know, who did all these great things, all these great works, you know, I'm the man. But he didn't because he knows that everything he did was not of his own volition. He knows that he owes everything to the work of the Holy Spirit in his life. Do you get that? Paul, the Paul, who wrote a majority of the New Testament, who was faithful beyond compare, the man who said, who we try to imitate when we, as Christians, the man who we look up to, recognizes that the Holy Spirit was the key to all that he did. So should we. Because failing to do so, failing to to include the Holy Spirit in your life and missions will be like me, who doesn't know how to ride a bike, trying to ride a bike without any help at all. A complete and utter disaster. But when we do include the Holy Spirit, amazing things can happen. What we dream of happening will happen, and so much more, because the Holy Spirit gives us the confidence and the strength the power to do what it is that we are meant to do.